and welcome back to the Meet the Translator podcast. My name is Dot and in this episode I'll be chatting to Janice Grill, a writer, scholar, artist and translator. I'll be asking Janice about her translations of Robert Musil's literature in particular and we'll find out how she's gotten to know the author so well, her approach to the translations, her plans for the future and of course her advice for current or aspiring literary translators. I hope you enjoy the episode. Denise, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast today. It's really lovely to have you here. <laughs> Hello, Dot. It is a great pleasure to be with you. <laughs> so, um, should we start off? Can you give a little bit of an introduction about yourself, um, who you are, what it is you do, and how you got to where you are now as a writer, scholar, artist, and a translator? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, it's a long story, so I, you know, try to make it short. Well, um, well, I studied art initially, but then I, um, my grandparents are German and my mother German Jewish, and so I would hear German a little bit when I would go visit them, but it wasn't a language I was brought up in. And then I went to Berlin um, to study art, actually, but then I started getting into the language. I'd always been very, very interested in literature, but I didn't really want to study it. But somehow when I came back from Berlin, I decided to study literature. So I went into the sort of more, you know, the traditional um, literature literature study, Germanic literatures and languages in New York, and um, was studying medieval literature and all sorts of things. But then I got hooked on um, this one guy, Robert Musil, who we'll talk about later. But um, mm-hmm. my professor at the time, Burton Pike, was the man who had sort of brought him to um, the English-speaking world. And he was a fabulous professor. And um, I didn't really study translation in graduate school, but there was this one class um, that was a um, literary analysis class where Burton um, taught us to read deeply, translation as a way of reading deeply. So we would have these texts, like one-page texts from different pieces of literature from you know the 1800s, the 1900s, the 1700s, and he would ask us to um, really analyze sentence by sentence the um, the kind of the kind of sentences, the tempo, the rhythm, the images that were used, um, things like that. And it, it, it was a way of deep reading, but it also introduced me to translating. So then I didn't really do much translating mm-hmm. except for my scholarly work, um, you know, whenever I needed a text or something to, um, to talk about. And then um, I think it was um, Mark Mursky, um, who runs this magazine, Fiction Magazine, which is a very old, prestigious um, journal coming out of New York. And he asked me to translate some museal because he was really interested in him. And I so I did um, a few diary entries. And I ended up doing a play um, of museals that had never been translated and so on and so on. And then I finally... Um, I was doing my own writing, my own art on, and along the way, but um, I kept doing my kind of academic scholarly stuff, got more exposed to more material that hadn't been translated, and got excited about trying to translate it, and did a bunch of querying, which, you know, we can talk about later when we talk about advice to young translators, but I finally, I got this one publisher, Contramundum Press, so excited and so... Mm-hmm. Um, ready to go. And so I published my first book of Museal, um, Thought Flights, and then we did more and more and more. So I've done five by now. And um, what else can I say? Um, I, uh, I taught college. Um, I stopped doing that so I could concentrate on my own writing. I just came out with a book of essays called Portals. And, um, but basically, um, Maybe what's important um, is that I have always lived a sort of uh, bohemian economy and uh, lived with a lot of people or lived, you know, cheap on the cheap. So I was able to um, concentrate on my creative work and my intellectual work, my studies, and um, it gave me the freedom to sort of develop the context and the uh, have the time to do this kind of work that isn't always immediately um, ri- um, doesn't always immediately bring um, <laughs> riches <laughs> and wealth and fame <laughs> mm-hmm. but that sort of I guess allows you to be more creative with it because you're not like constantly thinking about that sort of thing but yeah that's it's really interesting so 
As you mentioned, we are going to be talking specifically about your translations of Robert Musil's um, literature. Like, who is Robert Musil? What can you sort of tell me about him and what's special about his literature? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, in America, he's not very well known. Maybe he is certainly more well known in England, but you may not even there. I don't know. He was um, writing. He was born in 1880. He died in 1942. And he was... Um, part of a kind of um, modernist experimental writing that was trying to find a new way to use language to talk about the newly important um, kind of ineffable personal, psychological, emotional experiences. They had sort of, I mean, in, in just a very, you know, much too short historical cultural analysis sort of after World War One, I, I think a lot of people felt that language wasn't doing what it should do, that it was misleading people, that it was sort of um, not able to communicate the things that were important anymore. Um, people even had, you know, language crises, this idea that, that words couldn't... The words were betraying reality. But a lot of modernist writers were mm -hmm. actually, didn't find this necessarily something to despair about, but found it something that would, it, would challenge them to find new ways to use language, metaphor, um, stream of consciousness, different kinds of formal arrangements that would create the experience for a reader. So it was this is sort of a way of creating. So he, he was doing that. He wrote this very, very long unfinished novel that is called The Man Without Qualities that is set in um, the year before World War One in Vienna. And um, he wrote it and wrote it and wrote it for decades. He never finished it. He died in 1942. It was unfinished. It's um, you know thousands of pages long many drafts. So I was drawn to him through Burton, who was, Burton Pike was uh, doing this, um, he was editing and helping to translate the first, in 1995 came out, the first sort of fuller translation into English. And one day I heard him reading from this translation and it was so incredible, the way, the use of language. He was also um, I mean, relevant, and you know, you can cut, you can cut as much as you want. There's, you know, maybe there's too much. And I, I this is one of the problems um, of studying someone for so many decades is that there's too much. And um, in order to, um, mm -hmm. I'll tell you later. I'm working on a biography of him right now, and I, so I need to somehow distill all of this into, you know, 416 pages. But anyway, um, he was an engineer, a mathematician. He was a physicist. He studied um, the psychology of perception, he studied philosophy. He studied all these things. And so he had all these different vocabularies to talk about the human condition and the modern condition. And um, it's, just, it's just really special writing. It's really different than anything else. That must be really interesting as a, as a translator, like having to... Having all of that different vocabulary, I think personally, like as someone who doesn't generally do a lot of reading, I'd probably like. I think I'd be have to have to look through a dictionary even if I was reading it in, like in English, let alone let alone reading it in German. Like with all those different backgrounds, like do you do you sometimes almost feel like you need to have trained in all those different areas yeah. yourself to be able to understand it? Yeah, I worry. Sometimes I do because I'm I was really bad in math and science and I never, you know, I barely got through, you know, like 10th grade math or something. But so there is that that concern sometimes that I don't get all those references. But it's also he they're all allegories. They're all different ways of sort of looking at the same questions. And so if you get some of them, maybe that's enough. And also, and I think, you know, maybe we'll talk about this later, but as a, a translator who chooses what they're going to translate, you're always choosing somebody that you have an affinity to. And But then also you're choosing the parts of that person's work that you have an affinity to, and you're always leaving out other parts. You know, just as, as you know, when mm -hmm. you have to translate a word... You have to decide which aspect of that word 
you're going to stress or choose. Yeah. You could choose one that's more negative or more positive. And the same thing when you are translating a person or a person's work, you're always skewing it, <laughs> you know, to the parts that you think are important. And also as a literary critic, you're doing that, right? There are so many different museals. Every different mm -hmm. critic has a different take on what's important. And so, you know, you just do your yeah. best to try to be faithful, but also to be true to your own subjective experience of it. I guess at the end of the day, there is no way to translate it and have every single aspect of it all in another language because language just doesn't work like that and <laughs> you're not yeah. but yeah it's, it's fascinating so which of his texts have you translated I know you sort of mentioned a few already but um yeah um well I started yeah, with this? this play called Vincent and the Mistress of Important Men which had never been translated into English so that was really fun to bring this new text and I had a bunch of friends who were theater people this was in Burlington Vermont we did a performance so it was a premiere you know English performance that was fun and then and then I started to do these short prose pieces and that came out in the first contramundum book called Thought Flights and those are little short little stories and um, glosses he calls them or um and then i did a a book of a very experimental his very very early exp experimental stories called unions and that was probably the most mm -hmm. trans the most challenging translation i've ever done because he was really going into these almost impossibly elaborate infinite kind of and i think you know when we're talking, uh, maybe maybe the difference between literary translation and more regular um, speech translation is that literature often is trying to use language from the perspective of a very individual mind and sort of... Mm -hmm express the idiosyncrasies of the vision of a particular person. And, you know, what's easy to translate, you know, if you're in a, far, in, a, in a foreign country and you know the language sort of well and somebody says something that you expect they're going to say, you'll understand it. But the minute they say something, you know, a little different, you might get lost. And in literature, it's mm -hmm. almost always that they're going to say something a little different. And with Musial particularly, because he's such a weird thinker and such a, he really didn't want to fit in anywhere. So you're going along and you're translating and you think, well, you know, I sort of, I know what this means. I know, but then he suddenly says something that is so different than something anyone else would say or think. And then that's where you have to kind of find a way to say it that honors its its strangeness. But in normal kind of translation, you're not going to get that as much. People are saying kind of what you expect them to say, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> so the other things, I, I translated this book called Theater Symptoms, and it was a, it's a collection of um, his plays and play fragments and um, reviews of plays and theater theories about drama, but it's really just also about how he saw um, contemporary theater as a sort of symptom of the decline of everything. But that book and the following book, um, well, no, that book, I'll just say, was different, and it adds another layer to the um, translating, um, the job of some translators, which is that I had to kind of create an addition. I had to choose which texts to use myself. So it wasn't just translating a book that had already been in a book. I was collecting all these different texts, putting them together, leaving some out, and also providing context, introduction, and footnotes, and commentary, and things like that. So it's it's another kind of, another task of, that a translator might take on in creating a book. And then the last one that I just did mm -hmm. is called Literature and Politics, and that was different, too, because it was a book that someone else had introduced and collected. A um, wonderful German, an Austrian scholar, um, Klaus Amann, had collected all this, all these um, texts of Musil about um, his views on literature and politics at the during the rise of totalitarianism, and he 
had provided an amazing um, introduction to the context. So I translated his introduction and I translated the text and someone else actually wrote an appendix. So it was a whole, there were many, many voices in there. And then I also had to do an introduction and then I had to do footnotes because American readers don't understand all the things that the Austrian and German readers would understand. So it's sort of, yeah, Mm -hmm. multi-layered. Wow. Yeah, footnotes is a is an interesting one as well. It's not something I've ever really had to do with my translations. I think because obviously most of what I do is subtitling. There's no there's no place really to put any footnotes. Um, yeah, right. But yeah, it's 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 really it's really interesting. Do you ever find like obviously I guess the more of his stuff that you've translated, the more that you've learned about him. Do you ever think like if you went back and retranslated like the first play that you you did, for example, yeah. do you think you would do it differently now? Definitely. And I, I, um, I've i learned a lot. I mean, I, I think that as a very new translator, I was um, much more anxious about making kind of creative, bold changes. And I, you know, was more literal. And I think over time, I gained the confidence to see that to, you know, to change something is not a betrayal of the original text, but it actually gets closer to the original text. So things like that. I mean, I, I, um, yeah, I've become more, more free and more, um, more confident in my choices. Um, and also, yes, that is also partially because the more I know of his work, the more that informs my choices. And so when you spend a lot of time with a writer, you're really not just translating word for word. You're translating each word has, you know how the writer uses that word. You know what that word means. You know mm-hmm. that he might have used that word in another text, in another story, in another thing, and that it has, it's sort of haunted by all these other aspects. You know when he's being ironic. You know when he's being serious. You know when you might have read an earlier version that has a sentence that helps you understand the sentence that you're confused with here. And so that informs all of it. Um, The danger, of course, is that it maybe informs it too much, and then you want to explain things that he or she left unclear on purpose, which is always a literary Mm -hmm. translator's danger, you know, that you're going to explain too much. And I think that becomes even more the case when you think you know the person and you have this ownership over the person. However, footnotes are good for that. (laughs) You can can explain things there without messing with the text. Mm -hmm. Because I guess, like, a lot of it, as you you mentioned before, is subjective, so you also kind of need to give the reader the chance to be subjective in their own way as to how they read it, I guess, and not just explain everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you, you said that you, um, you got introduced to Robert Musil from, was it Burton? Burton um, Pike, yeah. Yeah. So how, ha- since then, how have you sort of gotten to know and understand Musil so well? Yeah, well, I, I ended up, I wrote my doctorate dissertation on him, so that was a long time ago, 2001, that came out. So that was many years in, in of deep research, and then uh, I continued to, you know, read. I went to conferences, I gave talks, things like that, and then it actually took 10 years, because I sort of took a good deal of time off when I moved to Vermont and um, did puppet shows and, you know, fell in love and planted flowers and wasn't really a good scholar. And then I got back to him somehow. And I, um, mm, I, so I published a revision of the dissertation in uh, about 10 years after I wrote the dissertation. So that required a lot of sort of um, re revisioning and revisiting. And then the funny thing about him, and, you know, um, Burton would always say this too, we would joke, is that you just, you think you're done with him, but you're, you're not. He had this, um, Musil had this aphorism about the, how do you know what a great work of art is? And that the answer is that it's inexhaustible. And it's, that's the way with him. There's just, you're always finding more. It's like Shakespeare. You're just always finding more. And so 
Now, what was the original question? How have you gotten to know him so well? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So I just keep, but one way is to, you know, the translating and that deep reading of translating is that I find that if you just read something, sure, you can take notes and ask questions and do a kind of, you know, um, really deep reading without translating. But when you translate, you really have to understand or try to understand mm -hmm what's being said so that's been a big part of it and then just immer you know immersion that's all it's interesting I can't imagine I think because like a lot of a lot of translators in fact most most translators I know like we translate such a variety of different things even if it's within one sort of specialism like I yeah. I can't even think of like one person who I've translated the most of their stuff of if that makes sense um yeah <laughs> so yeah. like it's really interesting that you've just sort of focused on this one author so like what what does that feel like just translating the text of the one author I mean I have done some other things certainly but I mean in a way I guess I sort of already addressed the thing these that question but there's a hmm. I just think, I'm, I'm, I'll give you an example. I have this, um, a friend, Elizabeth Tucker, who's a translator, and she um, just published this um, book of the essays of this um, art theorist, um, Henry van der Velde, who was Belgian. And she, um, his works were originally written in French, and then they were translated into German, but under his, he oversaw the translation. And so when she translated into English, she was able to use the, German text, the, the French text, and the German text. And so instead of just translating from one of them, she got the different aspects that the different languages could deliver and then created a sort of hybrid English text that had, had both Aspects like so, the German text was more clear. It um, explained all the theoretical aspects. The French text was more image rich. It was more lyrical. And then she was able to use both of those. And she made so in in a sense, when you work on a writer for a long time, you have all of these different texts. You have their biographical circumstances. You know the milieu that they were writing in. You have all of these things that help determine how you translate each individual word. So even though you are translating one text into one other text, there is all this other material and all these other um, nuances that help you to make those hard decisions that the translator has to make. So in a sense, I think the more you immerse yourself in a writer, the more you get inside their brain and sort of, I could never be Robert Musil, he is so brilliant, and as we discussed before, all that mathematical, scientific stuff I, I don't really have access to, but I have come closer and closer to knowing him and being hopefully able to give at least my personal vision of him to other people. Uh, it's Yeah, it's really fascinating. So obviously when, like, talking about the actual, um, doing the actual translation, when you're doing the translating... How do you sort of keep this strangeness of of his original language and bearing in mind also like the culture, the time period, things like that? How do you actually approach the translation and do it? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think that, you know, practically it's a question of attention to the kinds of words the person is using the way they're using the words, their tempo, their rhythm. I mean, there are some things that don't carry over. Um, you do German too, right? So, you know, I mean, those mm -hmm. sentences are yeah. so long and they carry so much and the, prone, the, uh, the articles um, tell you a lot about the antecedents. So there's a lot that a German text can carry that an English text can't carry. However, sometimes the sort of breathlessness of a really, really long sentence, the complexity of a really long sentence is really important. And so, I mean, sometimes I shorten the sentences, but sometimes I don't, you know, because it's really important for the reader to feel that kind of exciting um, development. But um, the other thing is that 
You know, when a writer uses a word that is odd, even in their own context, you have to know that it's odd in their own context. So that requires a knowledge of the way people use language at that time. And if it's odd in that context, you want it to be odd in our context, too, things like that. But um, you also, I, so this sort of goes back, for me, um, there's this um, wonderful, wonderful, brilliant um, literary critic called George Steiner, named George Steiner, who um, wrote a lot of books. But his most, um, the book that is about translation is called After Babel. And he um, had this idea. First of all, the main idea is that all communication is translation. We're always translating from one person's strange vision of the world to another person's. But that translation of language is sort of a litmus test of whether it's possible to communicate, which of course it is. But for him, the, you know, the Babel myth is that you know, we were punished by God so that we, were, we all had to speak these different languages and not understand each other. But his idea was that was actually a great thing because it created variety and richness of difference. So we have different languages, we have secrets, we have lies, we have fictions, imaginary realms that are different. And so he wants to keep that in the translation. There's this sort of, I think, contemporary philosophy of translation as this thing that will uh, kind of bridge all the differences and bring us all together as one. And, you know, that's great. And, of course, it's important. And, of course, yes, translation is possible and it's important because we need to communicate with each other. But if you make it so that you smooth out everything, so that everyone just sounds like everyone else, everyone thinks like everyone else, it's like, you know, the idea of Esperanto, this language that would, that this it was going to be this common language. Do you, did you ever hear of Esperanto? It's this wild idea of this universal language, but it was made by simplifying everything so much. And for Steiner, and for me as well, I really feel that to do that, you're eliminating what makes being human wonderful and what makes literature wonderful, which is the differences. So... This also is relevant, I think, to, you know, the contemporary questions of whether we kind of translate out the moral, the things in previous texts that are offensive to us or things like that, that we really want to kind of, you know, maybe change all the he's to she's or um, when people say man, we might want to change into woman or when people say, you know, anything that any kind of perspectives, any kind of language use that is different from our current language use, people sometimes think, well, let's update that, let's modernize that. But what I think is that it's actually important to keep those texts as they are so that we can learn from them and that we can um, expand our own consciousness, um, not that we have to agree with them, but but that we can learn about them and see how other people think. And that's also true of other, not just other times, but other cultures, that instead of kind of making it into, you know, an American modern dialect, that you keep whatever the um, mood, the context, the the level of diction, we would call it, you know, formal or informal, um, so that the the time, the place, and then on the level of the very individual person is communicated. And so how do you do that um, practically? Well, I think it's, you know, one, one, one philosophy of um, translating or one method is that you find someone in your... Um, in your target language, who you think wrote a little bit like the person, and then you say, okay, I'm going to make, so like, you know, someone is like the Jane Austen of German literature, so I'm going to kind of look at Jane Austen, and I'm going to try to make it like that, and that's good, and I think that's helpful, but even better and bolder, I think, from in the, in the Steiner tradition, is that you don't think about any English text that you know and actually try to let the weirdness of this text, the individual idiosyncratic specialness of this text and this person create almost a new kind of English that no one's ever read before.
Wow. Yeah. Because like, <laughs> it's it's really it's really interesting, and I think like it, you always are giving the giving the readers then the opportunity to like notice the differences themselves and like get confused and yeah maybe be like that sounds really odd or whatever because I think yeah. like you're right and there is a lot of debate around things like you know whether you should change something because it's an outdated idea that people had at the time or something that might be offensive to someone reading it now um yeah. and I think like that maybe that depends on what it is you're translating but like yeah I think in cases like this maybe it's good to be able to see the differences and it also might raise more awareness as to like how the language is now or like think more modern things that people are writing and reading um yeah I don't really know just my <laughs> absolutely and I um I recent one of my translations unions well, this was interesting because at the moment it hadn't been read it was translated um I think back in the 50s or 60s but it hadn't been translated since then and all of a sudden in the very same moment my translation and another translation of it were coming out but so so it was retranslated at the same time by myself and um this other other translator um and uh his translation was so different from mine and one of the reasons was because he decided to kind of make it more casual he wanted to make it more accessible and he put it into a kind of uh everyday language and a more modern language mm -hmm. and um i didn't and so they came out very differently and these are philosophies it's not you know right or wrong but you know, obviously, I think mine's right, but you know, it was what he did, and it's very respected, and a lot of people do that. <laughs> I've got, I've got a question which I wasn't, I wasn't planning to ask you, but if, if you were to have, obviously, he's not around now, but if you, if you were to have met Robert Musil, or like, <laughs> if you could meet him now, what would you, what would you ask him? Mm. Oh, so many things. <sighs> <laughs> Sorry, I've well, you know, you the book spot. the book wasn't <laughs> finished, so there's a lot of there's a lot of debate about how the book would have been finished, you know. So there there are questions about that, but I think um, <sighs> oh, it's a great it's a great question, and I should um, and you know they're very specific because I'm working on this biography now, and there are very specific biographical questions that I would ask them about. There's certain things that nobody really knows the answer to, but um, more <laughs> deeply. I would have a philosophical question to him about, I guess, there's a very fine line in his, in his writing um, between despair and hope. And, um, and this, it is related to translation because it's sort of a question of, of meaning, whether you can find meaning, whether you can communicate meaning, whether there is meaning. I guess I would want to talk to him about about those questions, about oh, it's so it's so complicated. But um, one of the things, you know, in, in contemporary philosophy, there there's a lot of talk about um, what's called social construction of meaning and the sort of idea that that a lot of our beliefs and um, our ideas of truth have have been kind of created externally. And Musil was part of, in a, in a sense, he came out of that that tradition of doubting language and doubting concepts and seeing that they were kind of often misrepresentative of, of realities. But he also believed in a tradition of uh, language, of literature, and also, as a scientist, he believed in truth and that we could not completely hold it, but that we could approach it, that we could approximate truth. And this is also related to translation in the sense that we can't absolutely translate one word into another, but we can try and we can approximate and we can um, do our best to get to the truth. So I personally believe, so I guess the question really is, do my interpretations of his philosophy, are they actually, am I skewing them? How much am I skewing them? to please my own personal beliefs. And, you know, so part of my own personal belief in this regard is that um, that we can communicate, that we must try to communicate, and that 
There are certain repeating, recurring universals that all humans can sort of relate to and that everything isn't just this kind of big, random, chaotic uh, free-for-all where the people in power come in and, you know, I, I, I just think that, that, that all throughout history people have, we've done our best to try to communicate, to try to understand the world, to tr we've done our best. And we still have to keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, but contemporary philosophy sort of likes to say everybody in the past was just, you know, corrupt or misleading and everything was treacherous and we just have to throw it all out and start over again. And so where is Musil stand in there? Where, where does he feel about, you know, what is what are his ultimate beliefs about tradition um, and individuality and all these things? <laughs> I'm very glad that you can cut. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. I think it's really. I think it's really interesting because I'm thinking also like a lot of a lot of literary translators. Now, I mean, I've spoken to a few that like they do have contact with the author, like when the author is yes. is still alive and they can communicate with them, and they do get to do their translation while in discussion with the author and yes. actually get all the answers to all of their questions while they're translating. And I just think that must be such a sort of valuable thing to have and to be able to do I dream about that but, yeah I'm always yeah, if only I could <laughs> ask him what this meant and yeah you know because yeah you don't you never you know you know even in your own writing you write something and you might look at it later and say what did I mean you know and all writers write things that are unclear all writers no matter how great and um, no matter how many times they've gone over it and it's been published and edited it's still unclear so we just don't always know. Mm -hmm. And it would be great yeah. to be able to ask yeah. him. You might not even, even as the, the author might not even know the answers themselves. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so yeah. you've, you've said that you're working on a um, biography of Robert Mules, Musil at the minute. I mean, how how is that going? And also what, what are your... Do you, are you working on anything else as well, or do you have any other sort of plans for the future, what you're going to work on? Yeah, well, I'm just about to sign a contract for the biography, and I have two and a half years to do it, and so that is really what I'm going to be doing. And I, it does involve <laughs> translation, because there are a lot of texts that um, I need to translate either to put into the biography or also just sometimes, you know, sometimes you read... And, you know, I read the German and I don't need to translate and I just read it and I take my notes. But sometimes the text is really important and so I want to really get into it. So I will translate it so that I can really understand. And then other times there are the um, bits that are actually going to go into the book. So those, so it's going to include translating, but it's different because it's sort of focus, focus, um, it's focused on um, this purpose of the biography. So, But that's really what I'm going to be doing. Um, and when I'm done, uh, I don't know. There are other things to translate. I, I might start translating somebody else. Who knows? Shocking <laughs> idea, but, you know, maybe I'll get into uh, somebody who's alive. I, I don't know. <laughs> Do you think that you'll get the biography translated into other languages? Oh, I hope so. Yeah. This is um, the first, it's going to be the first English language um, biography of Robert Museal. So I think that's kind of a big deal. There are many biographical works of, about him in German. Um, particularly, there's a 2,000-page one and a, another by this guy, um, Carl Carino, who's like the grandfather of, of, of German museal biography, and he's written many, many books. So there's so many. So I'm writing the first English one, and it's also the first, in a way, more general one because these German and Austrian scholars are so into every little detail because there is that level of interest in him there. Here, there isn't that level of interest. So yes, I think that my biography hopefully will be translated into other languages for other cultures that might not want that 2,000-page um, um, detailed biography. Mine's only going to be about 400 pages. <laughs> it would be so cool, because then the translators of that biography can actually talk to the author of the biography and get the answers from you if they're confused about anything. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> if it doesn't kill me, you know, writing the biography, then I'll still be around. 
But I was going to say that I recently did have the experience of having a couple of things that I wrote translated into German. Um, there were some, you know, some things um, that I wrote for the, the Museal Forum, which is the journal of the Robert Museal, and um, brilliant guy Thomas Hubel translated my essays into German, and we got to talk about it, and that was so fun. And, you know, it also, wow, you know, you really do realize that It's so different. The text that he came out with is so different from mine, and in many ways much better than mine, because he's a very good thinker, very precise, very clear. And he, and of course, in order to translate, he had to ask me questions that made me um, clarify things that were muddled, because he was doing the good reading. And um, so maybe a, uh, a translator of someone who's alive is in some ways like an e a really good editor, because they are looking mm -hmm. at it and they're saying, you know, hmm, what the hell does this mean? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so. I guess that ha having to sort of analyze every little, every little detail to be able to exactly. translate it. And speaking of literary translators, do you have any, do you have any advice for other literary translators or people who are maybe aspiring to be literary translators? I have, um, I guess, sort of aesthetic advice and then maybe not so good practical advice but I mean I think in terms of doing being a good literary translator I learned you know a lot from Burton about paying attention to melody and rhythm and also sort of thinking about but so I, I guess I would say that to do a good job one has to read and read and read and read and you know um, love words get into words and pay attention to syntax and melody and, um, you know, to feel not just the content, but how the content and the, the content and the, uh, form go together. That's, that's kind of the, the magic of the literary translation, right? You have to, and you have to decide many times you have to abandon one for the other a little bit. So, but really getting a feel for, um, for the, the actual text And then also for the context and the the milieu, the the history, the biography of the author really helps, and all that stuff, um, the society. But um, in terms of practical advice, well, don't do what I did. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> don't no. I mean, I chose to translate somebody who's obscure. He's mm -hmm. a white European male. It's not what people really want right now, in a sense. Um, if you want to, you know, make money as a literary translator, probably, yeah, don't do what I do. You know, translate somebody who is hip and um, maybe more politically correct and uh, cutting edge, maybe not German, learn some kind of uh, non-European language. <laughs> That would be better. But, um, of course, I want to encourage people to do to follow their heart, not to follow, you know, the money. And if you really, really want to do a um, some obscure um, dead white male, European male, then um, you can find people who are willing and enthusiastic about translating him. And um, there are so many um, wonderful indie presses nowadays, so many. And um, while they might not always have the money to, the money to pay you, there are grants, and so you should always look into mm -hmm. grants and try to find funding that way, and um, prizes. There are artists' residencies where you can go and do your work. Some that are just particularly for translators. So I would say that you know the first thing to do is you know try to build a community and make contacts and um, submit. Submit to small journals, big journals, submit to small publishers and big publishers, and, you know, just, you, you know, you, you'll see what they want, but you can, you usually have to give an excerpt of, you know, your translation, you have to say why you think it's important, and, you know, find those people who care about what you care about, and there are, they are out there, um, and some of them, you know, really want to do something crazy, and, um, There are also things like in German, there's a, um, an organization called um, Books in German, and they um, publish new books in German. So they publish new 
the new German books that have come out. And so you can scan that and see, oh, what looks good? What would I like to publish? They actually also give grants to people um, to help publish the books that are on that list. So particularly if you are into doing something contemporary, that's a good um, a good resource. And But there, I'm sure there are things like that in other literatures as well. I just don't know what they are. So if you, you look at um, what's come out that looks hot in, you know, a different, in whatever your language is, and then, you know, try to hurry and contact the uh, the publishers before someone else gets it. That's, yeah, really, really interesting advice. I like, I like that you mentioned building a community as well, because that's something that is often often comes out of of my podcast episodes like because I I Uh always ask my guests for some advice for translators at the end and the number of times that people have said you know network with other translators or network with with other people potential clients like anyone kind of doing something relevant to what you want to do or what you are doing or yeah building community sorry (laughs) building community (laughs) and I think like it is it's so important and it's so relevant yeah. for so many, so yeah. many different things. So I love that yeah. that was part of your advice. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it really is important. For me, almost almost all my work has, I'm going to say, actually come out of my uh, translating community on Twitter, which is now called X, I suppose. So as fraught and, you know, troubled that that platform is the um, translator and small publisher and writer Twitter. It's amazing. And those people are really supportive. And um, so I do really recommend um, that with the caveat that, you know, you could go down rabbit holes and it can be horrible. But if you can discipline yourself and not get involved in all sorts of crazy things, it's wonderful, especially, yeah, you know, look for translators, small publishers, big publishers, journals, and there you'll find calls for submissions. You'll find um, publishers who are looking for, um, you know, like Contra Mundum Press, I found, I found in the days before Twitter, but um, there are a lot of other ones um, that are doing doing translations and publishing translations. Some of them even have money. And um, But really, you got to talk to people and um, contact people, make friends. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah, I, it's, I, found, I found similarly, like, almost all of my work is through LinkedIn, actually, which, I mean, it's not Twitter, uh-huh. but, it, you yeah. know, it's a similar, it's just a different social media platform, really, isn't it? So it's... yeah. Yes, <laughs> definitely some good advice there. Just if, especially if you're doing something out of the way, if you're interested in some obscure person or obscure subject, and you're, you know, who I'm in rural Vermont. I don't, you know, there are very few people in this town who know who Robert Musil is. I mean, there are a few, but that's just crazy because it's a very special little town. But still, where are you going to find those people who care about this obscure person? And this obscure thing that you, unless you're living in a big city, you, you need to uh, find them. And some of them are, you know, I have contacts all over the world. Yeah, of course. I'd rather have them here <laughs> so, sitting um, around the table drinking tea with me. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always possible. <laughs> if, if anyone who's been listening has any more questions for you or they want to I don't know get in touch and have a chat with you or anything would you be happy for them to do so and okay you're nodding so uh, <laughs> what is the yes, best absolutely. way for uh, them to do this yeah well so I do I have a blog that um you can I think if you just look up my name but I think it's Janice Grill work or something it's Wix site W-I-X but you'll find me on there, and you can write me mm. through there. Um, I Twitter definitely. You are. I think I don't even know what I'm supposed to call it anymore. You changed it to X, you know, a few weeks ago. But I'm on there. It's just my name, Janice Grill. You can find me and um, write me a direct message, whatever. I'm fine with that. And um, yeah, that would be that would be great. I love to talk to people who are who are struggling, okay. who are excited, who have questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, what I think, fun! I mean, unless there was, <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been so interesting. Um, like learning all about this, I feel like <laughs> like I want to go and read read all the literature now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Well, I do want to say, if I made it seem like Musil was really complicated and difficult, he's not. He's actually really fun. He's really funny. And um, I recommend everyone to uh, to uh, 
pick it up because it's it's really uh, really. I found him immediately when I started reading him. It was like, oh, somebody who cares about the things I care about. It was just like that, and who's thinking all the things I'm thinking about, all the questions of how to live in this crazy modern world. It's in there, and it's great fun, and it's beautiful writing. So <laughs> go buy my books. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> Amazing. No, I, w- I think we should encourage people to go and buy the books. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me on my podcast. Like, I've yeah, I've really, really enjoyed our, our conversation and, yeah, learning all about what you do. <laughs> thank you, Dot. It's a, it was a pleasure to meet you and a pleasure to talk with you. And I'd like to hear more about what you do sometime when I have my podcast dialed because I'm very curious about that too. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this Meet the Translator podcast episode with Janice Grill. I hope you found it as interesting as I did. Special thanks to Janice for joining me today. Head to the show notes for some useful resources and links to get in touch with Janice. And if you have any questions or comments about the podcast in general, send an email to meetthetranslator at gmail.com.